Hello, Howlers and Bookworms. We're back with another author interview. This time, it's kind of the one I've been chasing since, uh, I guess, I first started this channel. I went to a Pierce book signing here back in 2019. I said, hey, I just started this thing called a BookTube channel. Would you ever consider coming on? And he said, sure. And here we are four years later, guys. It has finally <laughs> happened. Pierce, how are you this evening? I'm good. I'm good. I, I feel like my parents share your complaints. I'm hard to get a hold of sometimes. I go into my cave. I, like I said, I don't ever want to deter you from writing because uh, I feel like I've been waiting a billion years for uh, for book number six here here in a minute. And uh, I, I definitely don't want to take away if you got the creative juices flowing. Fair enough. Well, you know, it's uh, it's about siloing parts of your life. You know, it could be more organized, but I think it'd be less fun then. Uh, well, I guess I got to tell you guys, if you don't know, Pierce is a multi-time New York Times bestseller. You know, he he had a hard time. I think, uh, would you get like 120 rejection letters first? And then your first book hit New York Times bestseller. So that, that must have felt good, right? I uh, felt pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I will say it, it seemed, everything seems like an overnight success. But yeah, I was toiling, uh, trying to get representation for uh, six novels before Red Rising. And uh you know, had 120, 130 rejection letters. But I, I started putting them up on my bathroom wall. Did you really? Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess there's certain points in life where rejection hurts and other points. Well, I mean, it always hurts where it demotivates you or motivates you. And that was a period of my life where it was very motivating. Um, so I was uh, eager to get a book uh, published and then lucky enough to get uh, Random House to, you know, really do a great marketing campaign and uh, get this book in front of people. All, I mean, we're, we're glad that you did. Can you solve it? Can you sort out this garage thing for me? Because I've heard so many stories about like you were you wrote Red Rising above your parents' garage, but uh, but you were living in a professor's garage or something. How many garages see, did you yeah. live in? Yeah, no, I didn't live in any any garages technically. I wrote it above my parents' garage. Uh, I had a room up there, uh, so I suppose it gets romanticized a bit. But then uh, I actually learned that I'd gotten the deal after moving down to L.A. and I was working as an NBC page. I was uh, uh, giving tours on the, uh, the the NBC Universal lot and seating people on the Tonight Show with Jay Leno. So I was wearing the peacock tie like Kenneth the Page from 30 Rock. And um, so I was living in my uh, professor's workout room, which was like, you know, kind of his garage um, because I couldn't afford rent. And I was on an air mattress for my first like three months in L.A. He was nice enough to let me live there. So, you know, the man's, uh, the man's a legend. He kind of looks like a Jewish Richard Gere, as he says. <laughs> Very handsome, full, you know, white hair. He's my political science professor when I was in college. And so really gave me a leg up in his first couple of years in LA, first couple of months in LA. That's nice. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I just like these stories about like you were living in like three different garages and you're just like you know, <laughs> living off the scraps or something. I love it. I love the concept. Yeah. Just like sitting in the corner typing away. You know, every every time they write in a movie, it's this great montage. You know, I wish I, I suppose in like hindsight, it feels like a montage. But when you're in it, you know, you're just feeling like a gargoyle, you know, getting scoliosis hunched over a keyboard. So, um, yeah, I had, I, had, um, I was just happy to have a bed to sleep on both times. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. Uh, so when yeah. we met, we met in 2019. I can't remember everybody you meet. I mean, sure, you've done a billion. Was that in Austin months. then? It was, in, it was in Austin. Yeah, it, uh, it, uh, Murder by Book, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. Wait, the book People. Book People in Austin. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, yeah. remember when we were there, I asked you a question. And it was Dune-based. And then we just started talking about Dune. You never actually answered the question. So oh, I doubt it. Again. I said, okay. hey, I asked if you thought that, was Lysander actually like if Paul Atreides had taken a different path? If he had chosen a different path, you know, he's got like the mind's eyes, got like his own like litany against fear, basically. And yeah. you just said, oh, my God, I love Dune. It's my favorite book ever. And then we just talked about Dune for 10 minutes in Ender's Game, you know, so I yeah, never really actually enough. answered the question. So I'm going to ask it again. So he wasn't constructed to be that way. Uh, he was constructed to be more of a representation initially of uh, Octavius uh, Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar's heir, who became Augustus. So he was meant to be a more... Uh, introspective and cerebral than Darrow and to follow Lysander's rise to power. Uh, sorry, um, uh, Augustus's rise to power. I feel as though there was some, perhaps in Dark Age, that there were some more inflections of Paul Atreides, perhaps mm -hmm. most notably the his own like litany of fear. Mm -hmm. And I do like the mind's eye, but you know, the, the mind's eye, I'm sorry, uh, the litany of fear and the Benny Jesuit are where the Jedi come from in my mind. Mm -hmm. So oh, it's, yeah, kind, sure. yeah, it's kind of uh, the passing down through the time of, and that was, uh, uh, I'd say it's like a it's a it's a thing that's passed down every decade to a new sci-fi book. So yeah, it was my way of doing a, a shout out to Dune. So he has he bears some similarities, 
But um, I think Daryl also bears some similarities to later Paul, uh, mm -hmm. particularly in Iron Gold and Dark Age, when we're talking about the zealotry that's swelling around Darrow mm -hmm. and a jihad that's out of control. Pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, so um, are you going to be doing another book tour for this or are you just going to be writing right now and book tour later? So we'll be doing a book tour. Yeah, uh, it's a bit of a kerfuffle uh, getting all the dates uh, lined up, but uh, I think they finalized the dates. So I'll be doing about 11 cities, I think. So we'll be releasing them soon enough. Because, right, you know, I got these five signed when I was there. So I got to get them Gosh. signed. See? So. Gosh, <laughs> you know, and, and, if I don't, and if I don't get to Austin on this trip, I'm not even sure what cities I'm going to, to be honest. I've been so plugged into writing book seven and doing kind of the um, – I guess the, the follow up work on uh, uh, Lightbringer because they keep sending you, you know, new edits and stuff um, that uh, I'm not sure where I'm going. But if I don't get the awesome uh, on the book tour, I'll have to come down there because I love book people. Um, it's one of my favorite spots to sign. Yeah, it's a nice place. It's huge. It's massive. Yeah, we and that was actually one of my favorite talks in the Dark Age tour. Um, it was a pretty fun one. Yeah, I got uh, I got video on the channel of that, and you were uh, and you were basically cursing us because we hadn't read Iron Gold yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so let's see here. You talked about the rejection letters. Uh, were you shocked how much success you had when the first book came out? Were you, were you surprised at all? Um, I mean, I was more surprised that I guess it it got picked up. You know, then I was about it being successful because it was successful, but in it debuted on the list at number 15. But it wasn't like, you know, um, people were talking about it on Good Morning America or anything. So I, I think that Red Rising's growth has been the most surprising thing and how much how long its legs have proven nine years after its uh, initial release. People are still reading it. People are still gossiping about it on Reddit and Discord and gathering and creating communities around it. I find that to be far more surprising than, you know, a book that had a lot of, um, well, to be honest, it had a lot of marketing push behind it. So I felt as though the marketing push uh, made it seem like it would hit the list to me, but I did marketing push can't sustain a book. That has to be readers. That has to be that right. grassroots enthusiasm. So I think that that's been, staying power has been much more impressive and startling to me. So when you talk about the sequel books, uh, this is something that, uh, might just be conjecture on my behalf. I don't know if you consider it this way at all. You do feel like it does. The series does tend to slip a little more, more dark into going from basically like dystopian sci-fi to grim, dark sci-fi. I would call it. Mm -hmm. uh, was that ever intentional or is that just like mm -hmm. did you evolve like as a writer? Or did you plan on always getting darker and darker as it went along? I plan on getting darker and darker. And when you read this book, I feel like you'll understand why. Oh, great. Um, with Lightbringer. And the entire thing is kind of, I didn't so much have the events plotted out and the narrative arcs plotted out as I had the tonal structure plotted out. Um, because that's more how I operate. I usually have a tone for something and then have to figure out everything else. You know, like uh, some authors are very, very good and very impressive at creating these great outlines that are very detail driven. And then they don't really stray too far from them. I stray very far from them because I know the tone I want, but I don't know necessarily how I'm going to achieve it. And so for me, this journey was always about, um, you know, a, a archetypal rebellion in the first three books and then digging into uh, the disillusionment of characters of the rebellion, not panning out the way they wanted, making it more realistic as it goes. So, you know, really embrace the archetype, then dig into the, you know, the, the, the difficulties of violence, the difficulties of uh, the things these characters did in their youth, and then seeing whether or not the idea that they had, this noble idea of the Republic and of liberty, can sustain itself even when faced with its own demons. So it, it's kind of about, it's about that journey. And so it has to be darker because of that. Uh, but I think that Lightbringer, even in the title, gives you some semblance of the concept, uh, or the, some, some semblance of the tone that I'll be working with in this one. No, it's gonna be all rainbows and puppy dogs, guys. All yeah, sunshine. man. It's just gonna all be tea sunshine. parties. <laughs> it's gonna be tea parties, tea parties. Um, yeah, puppy because dogs. I joked that Dark Age felt like Joe Abercrombie had ghost written for you or something. Because I was like, uh, that's this, funny. Is, this is grim, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I've given Joe an earful over breakfast at Comic Con, uh, for how depressed he'd made me with his Giselle arc. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and oh, I'm actually in the sequel trilogy, yeah. Geez. Oh, yeah, man. Jesus. Right. Oh man. I also love Giselle so much because 
you know, the first time he sees real combat, he does pretty great. And then he gets his head caved in from yeah. the side. <laughs> it's just like, oh, oh man. Uh, you know, and his good looks, which he just loves, just oh, gone loved like chin, that. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's it's kind of like the Jamie Lannister hand, right? Being removed, and it makes him a much more compelling character. Um, but <laughs> you know, for me, it's the books inevitably will 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 uh, parallel my emotional state, I suppose, and also what I'm thinking of at the time, and the books I'm into. That's inevitable. That leak, that osmosis, you know. Um, but I do feel as though. Uh, the the darkness of the series uh, was intriguing and interesting to me because you're so rah rah Darrow, you know, in the first three books that I think it's more fascinating and challenges the reader to still like Darrow when he keeps fucking up. When you yeah. start seeing the, the the devastation that comes after ten years of war, and basically, you know that 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 concept in Dark Age, which is uh, the cruelty. I think it's cruelty is a thermal runaway, and it's just that each side keeps get, getting exponentially more violent to the other side because there can be no middle ground. No one can surrender. No one can afford to surrender. No one can afford to trust. And I think that can often happen. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think what I've told people is like, if you thought Darrow was like a little too, you know, Mary Sue-ish and forever, read the first act of Dark Age or not Dark Age of uh, Iron Gold. And you'll be yeah. like, wow, Darrow is fucking up. <laughs> like a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and I think that, you know, the 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 uh, part part of the, the what was so fun about the first trilogy was the pacing and uh, the wish fulfillment mm -hmm. and the wish fulfillment, not just of the reader, but of the main character of being ineffectual and small and wanting and having so much anger and wanting it to vent it out on people and then getting to realize it you know there's, there's parts in there where daryl just like enters a room full of people then he just says and i killed them all you know and it's just like <laughs> it's like that's cathartic you know but um i feel as though you know it's as as you write more you want to get a little bit more complicated complicated because you're interested in the things you haven't explored yet so if these books were stayed the same, then I wouldn't have as much fun writing them. I wouldn't be interested. I wouldn't be intrigued because I'm not like I'm not the kind of writer that's trying to tell the reader what to think. I'm trying to just investigate things myself, you know, investigate themes, investigate characters and uh, investigate concepts, you know, like uh, like violence. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I love Maul, don't get me wrong, but I've told people before, like, why are you not read the sequels? I was like, I like the sequels better, but I'm also a grimdark guy. So I like, give me yeah. all of it. Just, I'm going to crawl in the mud and just live there. And that's, that's, that's how, that's how dark no, I, I get, feel. <laughs> I get it, man. Like, I love Star Wars, but it's really hard to love Star Wars when stormtroopers, you know, can't shoot anyone except for red shirts. You know what I mean? Right. Like, right, so let's talk about the uh, Lightbringer. Uh, yeah. There's yeah. going to be a lot of questions about that. Uh, so we were kind of talking before we started recording, but for everybody else, uh, you it's not you did not actually decide to split book six. You actually just decided you're going to write a book six and a book seven, correct? Yeah, I was hoping that it would just be as easy as splitting book six. But what I wanted uh, books, I didn't want book six to feel like Feast for Crows, uh, for an example. I didn't want it to just be part of the narrative and only showing some of the characters. And I wanted it to feel like a complete meal in and of itself um, because cliffhangers are all well and good. And I've used them before in this series, but I also wanted this thing to have, um, especially after four years to feel like it was its own thing. You know, it's its own story, even though it's part of the greater whole. And so uh, I, heck, I threw out hundreds of pages twice on um lightbringer that question that was my next question yeah i mean what, what, yeah. What, what, were you just not satisfied with it or no or? man and i was going through existential crises i suppose multiple you know and uh, COVID, right did covid get you down yeah, covid got me down and then i had lingering mental effects from covid mm -hmm. and i was just you know writing i wrote it wrong and then i thought that if i just concentrated harder and dedicated more time to it i was writing you know 10 12 hours a day for most of COVID and then they're on. And I have probably written a million and a half words for this story that ended up being about 250,000 on the page. I mean, going through all my documents, it's easily over a million. So I'm guessing it's 1.5, like all told. And I realized, you know, I was, I was in my own head and I was editing and not trusting, not, not sending stuff to my editors because I wanted to be perfect. And man, it was just fucking, it was like the Ouroboros. I was a snake eating my own tail. Um, and then, then I found my way out of it. And um, that was 
uh, after having to scrap like huge chunks, which is hard because you look at those chunks and you're like, that's months of your life, but not just, you know, in, in, in earning potential and life you could have lived. Like I could have fucked off to Greece or something. You know? that's <laughs> awesome, dude. I could have learned to fly planes or something. Yeah, I'm like talking about whining because I wasted, you know, an hour on a TV show. I didn't like, and here you are throwing away a few thousand words. <laughs> yeah. Know? So the first time I, the first time I threw away like 300 and something words and I started again and I was really hitting the rhythm. And then I realized it wasn't good either. And that's when the existential crisis hit. And I was like, oh God. Um, and that I really had to find kind of the narrative, not the narrative arc, but I had to find the uh, emotional lessons and uh, spiritual lessons that Daryl was learning for me to really carry. And I need to have, like, there's always, like, like a lot of people will, uh, a lot of authors will say, write, you know, and this is the best advice ever, write the shitty thing first, then fix it. And I say that to everyone too, but I wasn't doing that. I was writing the shitty thing, then seeing it was shitty and then being like, I can fix it midway. And I was actually using a different writing software, which is one of the things that screwed me up. I was using Scrivener, not Microsoft Word. Uh, and I'm a very linear thinker. I'm like, boom. Well, I'm not linear thinker at all. But um, what happened is Scrivener has all those thumbnails on the side where you can go chapter by chapter. So you can pop to any chapter you want and then edit it immediately. Microsoft Word, it creates a barrier of entry for editing because then you have to scroll, you have to find, you have to do all that stuff. And um, basically, I just uh, found myself incompatible with that software and returned to the, the one that worked, Microsoft Word. And every time I try to get an alternative from Microsoft Word, I always end up going back to Microsoft Word. Dude, I know, man. And like, I don't want to pay it, a monthly fee for this. <laughs> I know. I, I It was a, that whole thing, and I was – thinking, oh man, I found this per the perfect software that helped me to like, you know, order my thoughts, but I function best in ignorance. I function best with my head down, plow through, write the chapter, get to the next thing, feel the, to uh, the, the pacing and be excited and write the next thing, you know, not going back and then trying to make each chapter the perfect fucking birthday cake with candles and like perfect lettering and stuff. Um, yeah. So anyway, Learned a lot of lessons. Right. Now, piggybacking off what Albert said here, I kind of want to ask you, I got an idea for like a fan club thing is like after the series is done, all the, would you ever let out what you threw away with the differences? Would you ever let anybody know these things? Or are you afraid they might like yeah. you better than you actually did? <laughs> I mean, I might do like, a, I might do like a, in an alternate timeline. Yeah. There's yeah, some cool, too. there's some cool shit in there. I have like my, I have like, you know, I can't tell you. Oh man, people read, I want this book to come out so I can tell you guys, you know, um, um, it's, yeah, I might, I might, I might, uh, it would have to be very clearly like, this is not what happened. And then I had, there'd be stuff that like, maybe is like shadows of the empire. This is the stuff that happened in the intervening time period. Um, I would just have to make sure that it, 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 it works and I might have to get it edited first. Cause it's a madman's writing. There's some cool right. stuff in there, though, man. I found myself reading it the other day, like this. That sounds like, like something to do at Hallorcon one year. There you go. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I did this whole like I did like uh, like a hundred or maybe more pages of a Severo POV that I uh, that tossed out. Uh, the book Lightbringer initially started as a Severo POV, uh, and just ripped uh, for a long time, and it just ended up not being the right thing. I just so you know, uh, Sam thinks you look like a sexy Jesus. Just put it. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> uh, so I hate to do this because I never want to be that guy, but I got so many people that ask this because I don't want to ask you when the new book isn't even out yet. Is, yeah. Do you have any idea when we might see Red God in our hands? Uh, you know, I'm hoping to have a rough draft finished by the end of this year. And I think I'm on pace to do that, but we'll see. Um, I'd love to get it. I mean, I'd love to be done with the rough draft by the end of this year. Now, the state that that's in, I don't know if it'll be possible to release it next year, but I'd like to. Sure. And so I'd like to do like a Christmas release next year, but it all depends on the muses, you know? Right. Uh, the time is there. I have time to do it. I have the will to do it. <laughs> uh, I've, uh, you know, hopefully I'll have the capability to do it. <laughs> Right, right. No, I, I hate that question because I it's so I was talking to Jim Butcher, you know, he took so long to put out peace talks and he said like yeah. while he was out of signing for it, people were like, When's the next one? <laughs> that's America, baby. That's yeah, America. That's it. I mean, I mean 
I, I gotta think it's annoying, but it's also gotta be nice that people are that anxious to 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 read your work, right? I mean, I, I think yeah. there's a lot of authors out there who would murder for people to want to read their work that bad, right? Yeah, and I mean, you know, on a day when I was tired, I might get snippy about that question, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think you know any writer is liable to do that um, because it's. <laughs> You know, but at the same time, you got to recognize the blessings, you know, that there are so many people eager for it, that people like this series, that the next book is anticipated, you know, as opposed to, gosh, what's it like to, I mean, it's been a while since I've written a book thinking no one will, thinking no one will read it. Like I wrote Red Rising thinking no one would read it, you know, um, that's why I killed Pax in that one, <laughs> you know, <laughs> thought no one would read it. I'm like, fuck it, let's just throw it all, you know, in and kill like the most lovable character. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then I got addicted to that. So, yeah. Well, the thing, the story that you told us in Dallas was that uh, it was either going to be Pax or Severo, right? Well, he, Severo, yeah. Severo was his name was in the hat. His name was in the hat. Yeah. 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 That's yeah nice. That hat, that hat, man. I lost it. I lost that hat. I, I, so maybe it's somewhere in my house. I don't know. Maybe it's like under a bus somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> but that hat was my hat and it was grimy and beautiful and uh, smelled like regret went through some wars together so went through is, some wars is red god really the end is this really the end you're not going to revisit this universe ever again or you never say nah, that i'm not going to say that um who knows i'll emotionally change you know uh, if i find something that's worth telling it um it'll i imagine it'll be the end of this 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 it will be the end of this general uh narrative okay. um but i you know who knows when curiosity will strike well you brought up the shadows of the empire thing you can always yeah in between her yeah. All right. And that'd be really fun. And, you know, the, the, the hard thing is also um, you want to write. You want to write something. And this is the trick of also writing this deep into a series. You want to write something that's fresh, but not something that makes the reader feel betrayed or betrays the experience of reading the initial books. Do you know what I mean by that? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel as though. The longer a series goes on, the more difficult it is to not do that, right? Um, Shadows of the Empire, for instance, is is a beautiful example of when it works. Um, I would say certain new movies in the Star Wars universe and shows are perfect examples of how it cannot work. So <laughs> I agree. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah, I think that was another question that you got in Dallas was if you could play in any in any other sandbox, what would it be? And you said Star Wars. And now the more and more of the mm. Star Wars stuff that comes out, I'm like. You know, Pierce, maybe you can write Star Wars stuff now because <laughs> they look like they could use the writers. Yeah. So. You know, um, it would be really fun. I worry about how many cooks I would have in my kitchen. That's that's the thing. Yeah. 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 And I, yeah, I think that there's a lot of great ideas out there. Um, and I know some people that have worked on some projects and then um, they got kicked off the projects uh, for Star Wars. And um, their original ideas sounded really fucking cool. And then what came out was not very cool. And so it just, you know, it, I'd prefer to make my own world, you know, right. yeah. um, but that would be a fun universe. Also yeah. fun universe. Grew up watching Star Wars, though. Who doesn't want to play in that for sure? Yeah. Pierce's hat is like the dickish cousin of Harry Potter sorting hat. That's so true. I got to find that hat. Yeah. <laughs> that picture of the hat actually talking kill packs. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. I don't remember what, what fantasy series it is, but there's this one where the sword is talking and it's bloodthirsty. Oh, that's uh, uh, you know, Brandon Sanders. That's Warbreaker. Warbreaker. That's right? Warbreaker. Well, I mean, there's oh, probably no. other talking swords, but that's there's other. Thinking. Yeah, it's something before that. It's something in the '90s. Um, yeah, and the sword is just lusty for blood. Most swords usually tend to be. How do you yeah. say go with the with with a scythe instead of instead of a, a sword? I don't know. I I wanted uh, I wanted my main character to be called a reaper, and it just yeah. some, certain things like worked. You know, certain things fell in line. And um, I felt as though, uh, you know, I'd never seen uh, a Messiah figure be called the Reaper, you know, and it actually works like sorting the grain from the chaff and uh, the old man of the veil. And, it worked. Yeah. yeah look, look at that. that. Merchandise and stuff all over the place. Now. Oh, look at this. I got this made for me. I'm going to talk oh. about all the merch. I got the Gory Dam, good coffee. You know, I switch oh, yeah. back and forth between Gory Dam and Bloody Dam like all the time. It's weird. I guess it's like, do you, you know, really? I feel, which, I feel a little which, high class if I'm feeling down the day. Which do you feel is a more natural fit for you? Probably Bloody Dam. I got Irish roots. So probably a little more Bloody Dam, I think. You know, was that was that intentional yeah. or was that just, was that Tim Gerard Reynolds? 
Like, uh, yeah. that's the question I got a lot. Was that intentional? Did you always kind of mean for mm -hmm. the breads to kind of be based out of Irish descent? Yeah. So my, my concept was that in World War III, uh, England got nuked and the Irish were forced to migrate due to radiation fallout. And they became a migratory workforce, much as they did in America's founding. And this so is the, the first book you should write, right here. Yeah. I, got <laughs> I mean, the conquering would be a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, and so they were the first Reds to uh, volunteer. Uh, I mean, the first ones to volunteer for Reds because, you know, you have the 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 uh, Luna Colony and they're looking for people who will work hard um, and don't have a home. <laughs> and so the, the Irish kind of made a lot of sense. Oh, it's good. It's, I mean, and, I can't audio. I too much ADD listening. AD. It comes from blocking out my kids for years. I can't. But mm. just everyone carries on about the audio performance. And he's, he's, and that's the question I get is he did he return for Lightbringer? He did. Yeah, he's doing all the voices this time. Um, I really wanted oh. to bring the. While I enjoy the other narrators, um, I do feel as though um, I want this story to feel as much as possible a return to the roots of the original trilogy. And Darrow is the presiding voice in this one, so I figured why not let Tim do the whole thing. Okay. I think people will be happy about that. Cause I heard lots of complaints yeah. about some of the other, other. Yeah. Narrators. I, I'm a Zen here. Uh, Victor is my favorite character. So yeah. Oh yeah. Mine, I'm the future. I mean, I'm the future. Mr. Victor. Yeah. So. I think Victor has the best <laughs> lines in this one. Oh yeah. Darling. I am the danger. It's like something I say to my kids all the time. Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> uh, oh, she's, she's got even, she's got an even better one in this one. Can't wait. Can't wait. Uh, it's so cool. Okay. Well, I got a lot of viewer questions as you would expect for something yeah. like this. And some of them are the greatest hits and some of them will kind of be really, that's what they wanted to ask, but okay. what books or, and or authors influenced you to become a writer. That's always the big one, right? I mean, um, the ones before, before I started writing, um, like I didn't, uh, I didn't encounter like some of the greats that I found after I became a writer are like, you know, Rothfuss, um, uh, uh, my God, first law, Abercrombie. Um, so I, I discovered some after I became a writer, but the ones that really inspired me were like Dan Simmons, uh, Frank Herbert, I love that. Um, God, Hyperion was really good. Oh, Hyperion is Hyperion's one of those books that it's like and Dan Simmons is a fantastic writer, but like he has to be struck by lightning in order to write that book. Yeah. You know, like that's that's a magnum opus that is just astounding. Yeah, I think that one set the bar so high I didn't really care for Fall of Hyperion because Hyperion was just so amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and Fall of Hyperion's a sound book, but it's not lightning in a bottle like Hi Hyperion is. It's just I, I I don't know if authors have more than one of those in them ever, you mm -hmm. know. Right. Um but Hyperion's one of my favorites. Um Gene Wolfe, I really adored. He's uh instrumental in like he has a character called Severian the Torturer. Is that very fun? Book of New Sun, yeah. Who's uh, this is a Shadow and Claw series, yeah. And so, um, he was heavily influential in giving uh, teaching me first person unreliable narrator. And so, Darrow bears a lot of emotional similarities to Severian the Torturer. Um, and Severian also had an influence on Severo's name, but then I learned that Servo means slave in Latin and that Severo was born. Um, so, you know, Gene Wolfe's tone um, and writing is just profoundly, profoundly good. Have you have you had a chance to read him? I have the nice folio site edition, but I have it because people tell me how dense it is. And I was like, okay, I'm in the <laughs> middle of reading Malazan, which is the most dense thing I've ever read in my life. I was like, I want to finish that it ain't. before I start something else that heavy. So uh, Malazan is probably the second most dense sci-fi I've ever read, with the first being Book of the New Sun. Yeah, uh, there's a writer, Christopher Rocchio, who, believe it or not, gets lots of comparisons to this and it did uh he's nuts about gene wolf and he's been mm. bagging on me like crazy to read gene wolf and i was like let me finish malazan first and then i'll do it yeah neil gaiman once said one time i don't really worry about paving new ground or something like that uh because gene wolf's out there and he takes the burden off all our shoulders mm. Mm. okay yeah neil gaiman thinks he's that good he's that good you know right right so how much reading and studying of ancient roman greek history have you done while writing this series oh so much. I mean, not all of it gets onto the page and you don't go into the detail because I'm not trying to be Gene Wolfe here. Um, and my books are so much about pacing and uh, kinetic activity. And so some of the so much of it doesn't get in. But I think that it informs the general um, how would I say it? the general tone more so than the exact detail of the story. But uh, quite a bit. I mean, you know, I've read uh, pretty much everything everything by Plutarch. Uh, I've read, um, gosh, Plato's Republic is how, Plato's Republic and Antigone are how Red Rising came to be. 
the caste system comes from Plato's Republic and the Philosopher Kings. Um, Eo's story comes from Antigone. Um, oh, okay. And yeah, I mean, it's about a girl who see. I mean, they both have an inbuilt pride, but it's about a girl who sees an injustice and decides to die um, rather than accept that injustice. You know, Antigone's brother wasn't allowed to be buried uh, by Creon, the tyrant of Thebes, and uh, Eo's uh, complaints are obvious. Um, but uh, what, yeah, so actually, great question, Albert. My favorite uh, period is the Great Man period in Rome. It's basically from the Gracchii brothers on down, so like 130s, 140s BC to about 31 BC, the Battle of Actium, um, because you see a successive line of uh, people that disrupt uh, the Roman state. Now, because that's the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, the, uh, the Roman Republic is that period. And so it's like you have the Gracchii brothers who are campaigning for land reform against the entrenched oligarchy. You see the oligarchy kill them. And then you see successive uh, four people that end up being like uh, populares, but almost always from like old blood and mm -hmm. in uh, Marius, Sulla, C uh, Pompey, Caesar, and then eventually Octavius. So it's like a really cool period uh, of history for me. So I've tried to read as much yeah, as I can in that period. We're getting down to the like exact years and dates and stuff, man. Oh, dude, stuff. like, yeah. I mean, if you ever want, if you ever want a fun time, Plutarch's Lives is really great. Plutarch was a uh, a Greek who wrote several hundred years after these guys died, but he uh, wrote comparative lives between great Romans and great Greeks and tried to draw uh, examples, like uh, corollaries, uh, thematically between them. And they're about fifty pages each, and um, they're kind of written like uh, New Yorker articles. They're pithy, they're fun, they're gossipy, um, and they really show the character of these guys. And so I've, I found Plutarch's lives to be really influential in the series. Hey guys, follow him on Instagram. He'll post just like random Roman artifacts on there. It's great. Yeah, really yeah. Cool. I gotta, I gotta get my camera set up so my like, you know, walls behind me so I seem smart. Uh, this is an interesting one. Your workout strength training sequences are among the most realistic and accurate in the medium. <laughs> What's your personal experience and workout routine? Oh man, I, I used to work out a ton. Uh, I think during the course of this book, I fell off, which is probably part of me having existential crises. In mental <laughs> health, you know, because you know you work out less working uh, out, more booze. Yeah. <laughs> well, they they say a ha they say a happy dog's a tired dog, or a tired dog's a happy dog, and I think the same thing goes with me. A tired Pierce is a happy Pierce, and so like um, I used to work out a ton doing. Uh, I did CrossFit a little while. I didn't really uh, like what it did to my joints, so I bailed on that. But I was. Uh, Pretty competitive in sports in high school. Um, played a bit in college. Uh, was going to go to college for either lacrosse or soccer, and then ended up bailing on that. Um, so I've always done sports, like since I was like five on. That's why so much of my stuff's about teamwork and leadership um, and comp competition. And uh, I feel as though there's a lot of lessons learned on the playing fields when you're a kid. That uh, you know, if you forget, you forget at your peril as an adult. And uh, so you know, I. Uh, I still train a bit, but I'm doing uh, getting into rock climbing now because I used to play in a bunch of like soccer, uh, soccer, flag football and like lacrosse leagues out here in L.A. But uh, at 35, I'm noticing my injuries heal very slowly oh now. I slipped the dip. He's still on me. So oh, uh, dude, just curious yes, about this stuff making my knees hurt. So. Yeah, I slipped my first disc and uh, oh, my God. I went up for a first. Little, like I'm a pretty quick guy. So I was like, I you know, I, I torched this one team. I returned to. I returned to uh, kickoff for a touchdown. I was super excited. It was going great game. Then I went up for a ball, like uh, like in the second quarter. Some guy took my legs out, and I just fell flat on my back and slipped the disc. So I'm just laying there thinking I'm, like, paralyzed. I'm like, oh, God, I'm 34. <laughs> and, you know, just, you know, that, that killed oh, yeah, my – yeah, I uh, 34. I thought I was so old. <laughs> my first yeah, but I wanted, like, I was 34, and I was like, what were you thinking? Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just don't want to be limping around. So rock climbing now. All right. All right. Well, be careful. Yeah. Be careful. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the audible version of your books are incredible. Uh, do you consult with Tim Jarrah Reynolds before he narrates the book so the characters reflect your interpretation of them? No. Like, the, the most I've ever done with Tim is pick him. Like I said, I wanted Irish voice actors, and they sent me a list of about a half a dozen. And I was like, um, I went through a mall, and I was in an airport. I think it was like Toronto Airport or something. And then I heard Tim's voice, and I was just like, you know, this is the guy. And Tim, uh, to his credit, has really um, has really identified with the material and in ways that uh, when I listen to him, and I don't listen to the whole things because it's a bit 
self-aggrandizing and weird and you want to edit stuff right it's just, it's just weird it's just weird listening to yourself like i'll look at i'll read passages and be like enthusiastic but it's weird listening to your own book for like 19 hours um but uh he he, he really breathes a life in into it that um and his own take that uh if i were that i wouldn't want to be hands-on with him you know so i'll give him a pronunciation guide but otherwise i leave it up for him to interpret and i think he's just so sterling at it um, I think that that was part of the difficulty with having other voice actors come into the world. And I don't think that they had the same, I don't think that all of them had the same love of the series that Tim had. Right. Um, I don't know that for a fact, but it just felt as though he was imbuing characters as if he was you know, ripping it directly from my directorial mind, you know, and then I would have the other, some other voice actors who, you know, had impressive uh, auditions and stuff um, do things that I didn't necessarily agree with. So that's why I wanted another reason I wanted to return this and put this in Tim's hand, you know, give your best run, give your running back the football, give Sean, or what is it? Uh, give your, yeah. If you got a good running back, give him the football. Don't go into the, him the rock. Yeah. That's how yeah. Feed is. him the rock. I, I got this one so much. It's probably the question I got the most. When you were speaking in Dallas, you said yeah. I'll have news about the TV adaptation soon. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. been four years. So. <laughs> well, I, I did get news, but then I got told that I couldn't share the news. Uh, um, we're stuck with where we're at. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> there's been a lot of things like that. Like as soon as I get the news, as soon as the thing happens, they say you can't tell anyone. Because um, like a lot of times authors will announce that they've licensed something to, you know, that it's in development somewhere. Um, but uh, the people I'm working with have eschewed that, that um, press release because it kind of means nothing. And so the reason there's no press release is basically I'm just wanted, the only press release I want there to be is that we're green light. Um, that is that we're green lit and going into production. So like, you know, we're on the precipice of success, but now we're in the middle of a writer's strike. Like we were right up at the gate again. No oh man. Then the writer's strike happened. So unfortunately, um, this thing's, I've been developing this for nine years, you know, in various iterations. First at, uni first at Universal, then I had it for several years and people wanted it, but I didn't want to give it away again because I didn't want to give it away until it's right. Well, that's what I was going to say. Please tell me you're going to be overprotective about it. Oh you're yeah. Let them it, bastardize it, right? As much as I can be when I'm not writing the hundred million dollar check to make it, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> right? So uh, my my protection comes or my ability to protect it comes from choosing the right people to be on the project because I didn't hand it off to a producer. I was the producer on it. So I was able to select the director. I was able to select the writer. Um, and that gives me a proximity and a voice in the room where often you don't often you don't get as an author. Uh, and I think, you know, it's one of the reasons I live in L.A. to be able to be close to things like this and also understand the industry a little bit more. But honestly, the, I'll be in the rooms helping make casting decisions, but I won't be the one making the casting decision all told. That'll be whoever writes the hundred million dollar check. Right. You know, so it's tricky. But, I, you know, shit, like we got to resolve the writer strike first. We got to resolve the issue of A.I. Um, and right now, studios, their dream world is their dream world is. Um, the, the uh, creative execs or producers come up with a idea, they feed it into an AI, yeah. they hire a cheap writer out of New York to do a, uh, a, a draft of it. Then they hand it off to a big guy who's made like 20 movies, um, to do uh, another draft on it. And then they do one polished draft through maybe him or someone else. And then it's done. And that means no, no authorial ownership, you know? That means books don't get translated as much. It means scripts will come from the producers and the studios, not from writers. And so it's a big issue. This AI stuff, it's like people never watch Battlestar Galactica or something. Did you guys not yeah. pay attention? Do you guys miss this? I mean, that's just like sci-fi since like the 1950s, man. Just yeah. don't, don't, don't put all this trust in, in AI and, and machinery. and AI. I know, I know. And it's it, it just follows that trend um, of... of um, well, that we seem to be following lately of uh, isolating wealth in one area, you know, by a few individuals. Mm. And AI plays even more to that than anything else. Um, now, speaking of Galactica, you use the term toaster in one of your books. I'm going to assume mm. that you're a Battlestar Galactica fan. Tru huge. I watched, I, Are you I had the, yeah. oh, dude, I remember I, I watched the miniseries when it came out. I, every Friday night would have to explain to my friends why I was, they, all my friends were wondering, what the hell are you doing? Like, uh, <laughs> and, right, why are you always late to Friday night to hang? What are you always up to? 
And I was in Texas and I didn't have many nerd friends. And so, except for one, who's my lifeline, who watched like Rome with me, you know, when uh, every Sunday when I would come out. And uh, so I always had to come up with an excuse. And finally, I'm like, I'm watching Battlestar Galactica, okay? Um, so yeah, I I adore that show so, so much. I say we all, man, it's great. It's age. Who's great, your favorite? Dude. Who's your favorite character? Uh, Dama, man. I mean, it's got to be Dama. Adama. Yeah, he's he's the man. He's the man. It's hard not I'm to. a Thai guy. Thai? No, yeah. I mean, I just Colonel Thai. Bobby Moore on that show, his writing was so sharp. There was like no characters I either didn't love or loved to hate. You know, he was just that good. And he started on Star Trek, and then Deep Space Nine, and then he went to Galactica. I was like, this guy. He's and still then he went to Outlander. Outlander. Now, yeah, he's he's, he's a machine. An interesting he, step. Uh, let's see. Someone asked why I want you him back. I want him back in space, man. Yeah, oh, me too. Me too. I, I would. Yeah. I would love. It. I'm glad the Outlander's done great oh, yeah. for him. Now maybe he'll. Maybe he'll go write a Star Wars show, and they'll let him. Oh yeah, him. I, 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 I was trying to get him for Red Rising, but he's just like, nope, I'm sick with Outlander. I'm like, <sighs> damn you. Hey, if Red Rising does get made into a TV show, I hope it's Apple because I feel like Apple's had. They, they're, they're they're concentrating on making stuff quality over quantity. It's not just this mm. instant flood of content like some of the other mm. providers are doing. And I feel like they're really giving care to sci-fi stuff. They really are. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, um, whoever makes it will have to be wanting to tie – whoever makes it, I know, but I can't say. Whoever <laughs> makes it will have to be wanting to tie it into the marketing even for their streaming service yeah. because it'll be that, that expensive of a show if it's done right, um, which is one of the reasons it's been so slow is that whoever it is is taking it that seriously and does want it to be that big a deal for their streaming service. So it's like – um it's really it's really interesting because it's amazing thinking like all these projects that spend so long in the hopper um it takes so long to get developed and you know with each one of them there's someone a lot at every step of the way they're like yes it's finally getting developed and they're like you gotta imagine like imagine like you spent nine years getting something developed and then it comes out and it sucks and yeah. you know it sucks mm -hmm. but you also know how hard it was to get done but it, it just sucks and now you don't even get a water cooler conversation about it. You know, it's gone like that fast. I can't imagine what that feels like. So I'm doing everything I can to make that not happen with Red Rising. I but tried to get him to let it slip out, guys. He's 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 a bolt. He's not going to hey, let out. <laughs> I haven't started drinking yet. Yeah, that's, that's after work and done. So I like this question. I'd love to hear how you decided to go from a single POV to multiple POVs and how did it affect the writing process? Um, I wanted to flesh out the world more. Um, if you notice, I started every POV has something, has a bone to pick with Darrow. Um, and there's a mid color, there's a low color, and there's a high color. And so it was my way of showing representation because the books are about representation. Um, you know, and I'm not talking about like the representation uh, that parallels our world's uh, idea of it, but it shows representation of their world and showing the high, the mid, the low, and showing the different ways in which Darrow's affected lives and the pros and cons of it. And then test out the thesis of the rising um, on these characters and the, test out the other characters on these characters based on their position and see where they fall. So it was my way of wanting to go deeper in the world and explore uh, a more three-dimensional, less archetypal um, version of the Red Rising world. And I think that part of the you know fun about doing four more books, and you'll notice that the pacing of the, how fast these books come out goes way slower. You know, Red Rising was 2014, Golden Sun 2015, Morning Star 2016. And then these other books have taken a lot longer to write because it's way harder for at least how my brain works to do multiple perspectives. Um, I think one part of me wanted to show I could do it, but mostly I felt as though, and I was talking to my editor about it, and we just felt that it was right, the best way to do the story justice. And I think in the end, as I've gotten more versed in writing multiple POVs, and I think in the end, it'll make the story mean more. And I think it'll have the story say more. Um, That's kind of why. No, I'm glad you did, because I think right, right up front, you get Lyria, and you're seeing that like, wow, you would think that Reds would like worship this guy. And you're seeing that she's got all this hatred for him. So I love that. Yeah, I love yeah that. And, 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 and it annoys a lot of the readers. But then I'm happy about that because... I see it as, oh, how do I stay true to the character, but then get these readers to realize, oh, this is a worthy character. Very Doom Messiah. Very Doom Messiah. I, like I love Doom Messiah, even though it's so disillusioning. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what uh, a lot of people lose on Messiah because they don't understand it yet. 
the series isn't about Paul. Uh, and it I just know, breaks people's heart. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was hard for me to stomach when I was 15 years old. And reading oh, that. I know, dude. I was so like, you know, I didn't really abandon Dune until God Emperor. I think God, not, got, not abandoned, but I didn't get like, I didn't lose heart until God Emperor. Yeah. You know, I think there's a divisive one for sure. <laughs> uh, it, it's just a little, it's just, you know, you can't go like 4,000, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, the Lato worm thing. Uh, yeah. Okay. I don't want to ruin it. Sorry, guys. So how do you come up with the names in your series? I find it has some of the best names for things like Sling Blade, Pulse Fist I've come across, but what's up with the oh, thank you. capitalization in the names? Camel Case, the future. <laughs> I hadn't seen it done. You know, sometimes you choose something, a convention, the first one. And you stick with it, you know. Um, so I'm stuck with Camel Case. I know I, yeah. I dig it. Like I said at first, I felt like that was like him just saying, "Okay, this is this is what technology is like now." I don't have to explain it to you because it's just normal. It's like if someone yeah. from the '50s was reading a book about now, you wouldn't stop and tell them what your iPhone is. It's just something that's part of your daily life, you know. I think it's also part of like making it descriptive. You know, uh, the, the describe it in the name instead of having to constantly wonder what a thing is. Like Pulse Fist, it's very obvious what it is you know, grab boots, things like that. And the camel case helps, you know, differentiate it from other things. Um, and also um, one of the things in the early books I didn't want to do was slow down and, you know, really have to info dump all the time I had mentioned something new. I wanted to show something and then show how it's being used. Other things I wanted to show or name and then you not know what they are really, like Iron Reigns, like uh, Iron Rain I dropped uh, in... Uh, Red Rising saying the Telemannus were born to fall in Iron Rains. And, you know, when, when that Iron Rain, and you keep hearing about Iron Rains and like when Iron Rain falls, be brave, be brave. And people continually mention it. And then when it finally fucking happens, Darrow's locked, locked in the spit tube. And you don't, and it's like one camera shot just following Darrow down. You're like, oh, fuck, that's an Iron Rain. So sometimes it's really fun to build up things like that. Like Lorne, Lorne Alarcos was mentioned a bunch of times. And then mention a little bit more detail, then a little bit more detail, and then you finally meet him, you know, on, and it, on his windswept castle, and you're like, "This is the G, the legend." And he's the amazing, myth. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thor's the bomb. Uh, so let's see here. I got. Oh, I'll, I'll, Go I'll definitely be trying to get Bear McCreary to do the music. I certainly will. Weirdly enough, uh, and this is the only name drop I'll do because it's so our people. Uh, Bear and I were like, we're sitting across from. Uh, a guy on a plane like years ago and he was reading night uh nightfall uh or no dark night rises i think um what's the old frank miller one called is it dark night rises dark uh, night returns. Return returns yeah dark night returns he's reading dark night returns and then we just i struck up a conversation about dark night returns and then ended up uh chatting with him and eventually asked what he did and his wife uh, he says he's a composer and asked him if he's done anything i know he says probably not and then his wife leans over and he says, uh, he did the music for Battlestar Galactica. And then I basically shouted, you're Bear McCreary? And he's, <laughs> and he's like, you know who I am? And I'm like, I love you. Yeah. Yeah, I <laughs> and so I made him become my friend. So I'm there. I've been like courting him for a long time. So if the show gets greenlit, uh, I, I'm definitely going to pressure him to try oh, to do outstanding. the music. Outstanding. Outstanding. I'm going to pressure him. about the, the new He-Man show. Is yeah. Music. yeah. Oh, he's so good, man. Yeah, he's so good. But he's so busy, you know? Yeah. JJ Abrams tapped him for so much stuff. But, I said he's uh, basically the John Williams of like TV. You I know he TV. is. Yeah, yeah, one of the cooler things I got to do in LA ever was Bear invited me to a uh, uh, scoring session of The Walking Dead, and so I got to go to like uh, Warner Brothers late at night, and everyone's off the lot except for a full symphony, a full orchestra that he has uh, in a sound recording room because he's he's one of the few um, uh, composers that uses a full orchestra. Uh, cause it all comes out of the, the music budget. And so he decides that he wants to work with, you know, real musicians and work with a full orchestra in the room. So I got to sit there with his scoring, like, I guess like season five, the walking dead or something, which was yeah. like, as, as a nerd, that was my oof, moment. Yeah. That whenever so I've listened to Bowser Galactica, I just want to like get him just like start playing drum solos. Oh like, dude. Doo -doo 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 -doo. So good. <laughs> yeah, so good. I even listened to the outlander soundtrack, man. Uh, so is the whole world of Red Rising as bleak as the sequel series seems to be, or are there pockets of people just going by living their normal, happy lives? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, uh, World War Three wasn't exactly, uh, World War Two. sorry, World War Two. you know, the world's at war, but there's still villages, you know, thriving. There's countries not involved. Uh, yeah, there's a whole parts of it like that. Um, the problem is uh, the ability for, the governments um, to, how to say it, 
extend their power or to project their power is quite vast in the Red Rising world. Um, so it's difficult for someone to evade the notice of the government if they're like significant, but like average people and stuff like that um, can, you know, Venus hasn't even been attacked yet, you know? Um, that said, life on Venus, if you're not one of the higher mid colors, can't be that great. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But Lightbringer shows a bit more of uh, uh, the world. They'll say. All I know is after reading Dark Age, no one is happy on Mercury. Like, no one can possibly be happy on Mercury. You know, there's beautiful places in Mercury. There is, there's spring. We don't see any of them. <laughs> well, no, we don't because they're battling in the Ladon. Yeah. But there's the Hesperides Springs, which are these mountain high springs. Yeah, I really wish I. See, these books would be like, you know, 1,200 pages each. Right. I got my, you know, if I didn't have my editors, my editors, like I had this, I had this, I had this lovely bathing scene, you know, in the mountain high, the high, high mountain passes, which are more temperate because uh, they have these big plateaus on Mercury, which are in the temperate zones. And they have, you know, they have snowfall there. It's not all blasted furnace. It's just that, you know, in order to have temperate zones, you have to have blasted zones, especially when you're that close to the sun. So the, the, the waste of Ladon is basically like their Sahara, you know. But um, there's lovely places on Mercury, and there's a whole nother, there's a whole nother island, you know. Yeah, we just don't go there sometimes. That's fine. It would kind of kill the, it would hey, kill the bleak mood, guy. Yeah, the Ash that. Lord, the Ash Lord was living on a beautiful archipelago until Darrow <laughs> came with his mini nukes. Yeah, it's like uh, people talk about how oh Malazan is just like completely cruel and unusual punishment, and then it's like oh, but someone pet a dog at the end. It's, it's yeah, someone pet a dog. Someone pet a dog. Yeah, exactly. I'll play off of this one with this question: If Red God really is the end. Do you have any plans for what you intend to write next? And can it please be epic fantasy? Yeah, I got one of those cooking. Do you? Mm -hmm. Just I idea just or you got any drafting, done, any drafting done? Oh, no, no. I just idea. I find it uh, I find it a violation of my contract with the reader to be writing other uh, no, novels exactly. when this one's not done. Do you read but, Do you read while you're writing? Do you read other books while you're writing? Or do you feel like yeah. you're influenced? Um, it's really hard to read people like, um, like I can read fantasy and sci-fi more easily than I can read, say, um, Grapes of Wrath. You know, if you're reading or if you're reading like really jaw droppingly ornate writing, it's very difficult because it can affect your voice. Um, if you're reading other sci-fi and fantasy, I'm not worried about stealing other people's ideas. I'm worried about stealing, or I'm, I'm worried about my uh prose getting affected sure sure this one kind of plays off of the next question here after reading dark age i have to ask who hurt you <laughs> and kyle wants to know why do you hate the telemonis uh, <laughs> um you know there's this one time cavix pushed me and sophocles stole my jelly beans <laughs> and since then it's been a fatwa on that family mm -hmm. um I've been asked that question quite a few times, <laughs> you know, I haven't I had a producer asked me in the middle of a meeting and this didn't even have anything to do with red rising. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I moved around a bunch. So there were a lot of people, I suppose. Well, I know that I, I can only hope the readers now. chapter in dark age has something to do with maybe a tree where I was like, Jesus Christ. Oh uh, yeah. No, yeah. Abercrombie's clutching his pearls reading this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you make decisions and then you look back on it and you're like, I can't believe they let me get away with that. Right. Right. Yeah. I can't believe my editor read that. I'm like, that can stay. I can't believe that. Before I forget, I do want to pay you a compliment that I think is like the highest compliment in that. I think the ending of golden sun is probably the first time reading a book. I was as shocked as I was the first time I read the red wedding. And I read the red wedding long before people even knew what the TV show was going to be. So I, that was Same. like, I was so messed up after I read the Red Wedding that I like had to put the book down. It's like stare blankly at the wall for like an hour. Yeah, that I was I read it. the Golden Sun. I, I, think I, I read the it. Golden Wedding now. Yeah, the Golden Wedding. Uh, yeah. I I read the uh, Red Wedding in like what two thousand three, two thousand two, or something. I remember exactly the couch I was on. I remember the exact feeling in my chest. You know, and you're so right about that. Like, because no, and I and I was also not in part. I was not a part of any sci-fi or fantasy community, so I had no idea what to expect in these books. And I don't read review. I've never read reviews. So like I was going into like Game of Thrones blind. So when the red wedding happened, I was just like, you can do this to your characters, to your right. reader. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. The funny thing is it was initially a, uh, it was initially a happy ending to the book. Uh, Darrow got married to Mustang and become, became the heir of uh, Arch yeah. Governor. 
And I submitted that in the first draft and my editor was like, this isn't, this isn't right. Um, and I was like, you know what? I have another hunch. And then I just wrote this scene like a two week period and sent it to him. And he was like, what the hell? <laughs> he said he dropped his, he dropped when he had to walk away from his computer, he just stood up and was doing this like what? Yeah. And like, and the sheer amount of the sheer amount of carnage in that, like that's what's shocking to me. And, and I sometimes regret it because I loved a lot of the characters in there because it was fun to write. And so I do miss writing. I did miss writing. Like, I mean, like Lauren, Nero, uh, like just those two alone, you know? See, guys, sometimes editors aren't all bad, you know? So oh, no. We get some editors, are, no, editors are great. They're, they're, editors are great. They, they make everything I write decipherable. You know what I mean? Is it true that you get power from your reader's tears? <sighs> This thing on the side says <laughs> readers tears. Nice. nice. Uh, but no, I mean, I'm not doing it. Like I feel as though there's also a thing I got to watch out for and every author should watch out for. It can't feel like you're just abusing the reader. It can't feel like that's the only reason it happened. If it doesn't like, and there's, there's a sense of betrayal that can happen in the story that you're doing that just to hurt us, you know? And so I don't do that. I do it because it makes sense to me in the story. Um, I, I delighted to twirl my mustache about it because that's fun, but, uh, it's more so, um, you know, there's, there's plot armor in, uh, but a lot of times an entire band of people will have plot armor, you know? And I just think that the more characters you take away, the more, uh, precarious the world feels, the more you're paying attention to every scene more you're like really sinking in and loving the characters because you don't know what moment of will be your last with them. And I think that that's uh, something that can make these books really feel immediate, you know, especially since it's immediate present tense. It's like, you never know what, when something's going to happen. Hey, how'd you come up with twitching meat carpet? It was a dark day. Uh, oh. I was probably drinking whiskey. Wrote that at like two a.m. Uh, I have no idea where that came from, but I was imagining like I was imagining just like threading bodies together, oh and just th I had this kind of like uh, this berserk image. You know, have you seen Berserk? Yeah, or yeah. Red Red Berserk? Yeah, um, yeah. I just had this berserk image of all these bodies kind of like entangled together as a floor, as a carpet, just twitching together. Yeah. I have no idea. Great. I read that. I was just like laughing at that point. I was, like, I was shocked chaos. that that one did. Well, what I wanted to do is build up this feeling of like Darrow just getting, you know, th this feeling of ingratitude and frustration at the mob that Darrow was feeling, whether right or not. And I just wanted him to be constantly like not, how to say it, he, he was holding himself back, holding himself back then, and he just let him have it. Right. And it's just like sometimes it's really fun to have a character who's a good person <laughs> And then to see what their bloodlust says in their head when they're doing it. And that's Darrow's internal monologue, you know, because he, when he goes dark, he just goes dark, you know? And so I'm trying to be like, just because he's a good character does not mean he's not going to be very visceral with what he's making, you know? Hey, this is a great one here. How much did, uh, did you put, uh, how much of Pierce put into Darrow and how much of Darrow has gone into Pierce? Um, it's inevitable that there'll be some part of every character from you, whether it's projection mm -hmm. of, you know, your concept on something or your take on something. Um, but I'd say Darrow's journey is always somewhat mirrored mine. Not that I feel, you know, um, not mirrored mine perhaps, but I was struggling when I was younger of finding purpose when I'd gotten out of school. Um, shout out to Ephraim, um, worthy. Um, I feel as though Darrow was my catharsis, you know, in a vehicle for that catharsis. You know, I was trying to find like, uh, you know, one of my friends said to me um, in school that he, he kind of wishes there was a great war <laughs> so that he could have like meaning in his life. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I get the sentiment. Now, I, I'm sure if you were in that war, you would not want that. Um, and if you want war that badly, you can go, you can go fight, you know. But um, I felt uh you know, this, this aimlessness in my own life. And so I think that stories provide a wonderful vehicle for us to create um, more evocative uh, reflections of our world, you know, and, and allow us to have good and evil and allow us to have missions and allow us to have vendettas. 
And so Darrow really allowed me to have purpose. And so getting Darrow's story done was kind of my purpose. So that was really helpful. And the last one I got here, uh, did it piss you off when people compare Red Rising to Hunger Games? And did that contribute to the darker and darker tone as the series went on? I know you had to hear it when the first book came out, right? Yeah, I had to hear when the first book came out. But here's the thing. Uh, I, yeah, I like Hunger Games, but I always thought it was more Ender's Game meets Lord of the Flies. I always thought it was Battle Royale. I always thought it was Running Man, you know. Uh, and for me, like there's influences of the Hunger Games, I guess, certainly. But. The Hunger Games is also influenced by those books, which I've read multiple times. I've read The Hunger Games one time. So, uh, you know, they put it in the marketing, but it's also a thing like people weren't buying people. It's impossible to sell it a space opera. It was impossible to sell a space opera. And so I really looked at the publishing market and I was like, or well, how do I get them? How do I trick them into, you know, buying a space opera? And so Red Rising was, is, feels like the most young adult of the series because it is. It's, there's actually even a love triangle in it, but I didn't want to have a love triangle. There's a traditional love triangle. I wanted to kill one of the sides. So it's EO, Mustang and Darrow, right? But one of the sides is dead of that. One of the points that love triangle is dead because then it's much more interesting because then he, he can't love Mustang because he feels like he's betraying his red roots, his yeah. people, the memory of EO, the very thing he's fighting for. So there's a love triangle, but I want to make it interesting. There's uh, you know, a tournament aspect, but I wanted to take it to the fullest extreme and make it based in military strategy and all the stuff I love. And so it was really a way of like making a Trojan horse. Red Rising was making a Trojan horse and using this tournament aspect um, to get into the space opera. Because when it hit Golden Sun, it's like, that's the series I was really, really wanted to write. Um, so it's, it's, you know, after writing six books, I decided to become practical about it and figure out a way that was like, um, I mean, it, there's also like Harry Potter Goblet of Fire in there, you know, there's uh, Harry Potter elements and uh, house elements from Game of Thrones, you know, um, there's medieval elements, right? And so there's a lot of things. There's a Count of Monte Cristo kind of feeling to it. Um, I find Hunger Games to be the low hanging fruit of comparison. I think it's just because those movies were big when the first yeah. book came out. That yeah, the easy comparison. Yeah, you know? but I mean, Ender's Game. I feel like is like only, like Ender's Game has so much more DNA in it than uh, I mean. Red, I feel like Red Rising has so much more Ender's Game DNA than than Hunger Games. But you know, that's probably because Ender's Game was one of my favorite books. You know, mine too. Mine too. Well, Dude, guys, uh, uh, Pierce is really really writing. He's like he just heard the alarm go off. Yeah, I, I, make sure. I, you know, the thing is, man, I can do so. I can do another 15 minutes if you have more questions. Uh, I mean, I can think of somewhere we can take some of these I've been, I've been ignoring in the, in the yeah, chat let's here. Take, let's take 15 more. Yeah. Okay. Guys, if you want to ask questions, now's the time. Uh, do, do you get annoyed by people saying that this, it's kind of funny? Cause this is when I was first discovering the series, a friend of mine was reading and he's like, you got to read mm -hmm. these red rising books. And I was like, Oh, I don't really read, read YA. Does it mm -hmm. annoy you that people think your books are YA at all? Because I, yeah, now that yeah, I've read them, I'm like, how can you think someone getting stabbed to death in the eyeball is fucking YA? How? Yeah, it, it used to annoy me, but I think that's just ego getting in the way because I want my books to be treated seriously. Yeah. I've only really read like two YA books, so I'm not really sure what YA even is, you know? Um, oh, this? This is a mop. <laughs> look at this. I look like, I, I feel like I should be like an emo band. You got like no gray yet. You're fine. Oh. <laughs> you tied it really well. Yeah. He's got good no, lighting. no, I, I have not dyed it. it. If you see me in person, you'll see the grades. Um, the uh, these are reader tears that I rub in. That's what it is. If they were going to make the series and you got to fan cast Darrow, whoever you want, budget's mm. not a thing. You have any idea? Mm, not really. I mean, I feel like that's someone that has to, you know, really represent in the room. And everyone keeps aging out. Then when I do fan cast it, you know what I mean. Yeah, that's the thing um, to think about. If you say it was a big hit, would you, if would I could, you recast it for older If I could get, or? if I could get like a, a muscular Killian Murphy, that would be my Darrow. Killian Murphy's mm -hmm. stare and his face and his presence is always what I imagine Darrow to be. You know that intensity. Can you sing EO's song? No, <laughs> I'm a writer. <laughs> that's good. Can you do the dance? I can. You can do the dance. <laughs> Okay. Too soon. Too uh, soon. Uh, did, hey, did Cassius and Virginia ever actually hook up? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I mean, Cassius. I mean, you know, what I love about that is the is the gala scene is like 
Darrow is just like so pissed off. I just like hate his face so much. But he's just like he's so damn handsome. He's square jaw. And he's so mm. pretty. Goddamn, his beautiful uh, girls. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, you know that guy. Everyone in high school was one of those guys. You know, and you're just like my best friend in high school was that way, and it was so fucking annoying. You know. Uh, and I'm just like, but he's an idiot. Oh, like, women love him. I love Cassius. I love Cassius so much. It's so yeah. weird because it's like you go through that first that first trilogy and you feel like you're. I should be hating Cassius, but you can't. You can't. You can't. I feel like Barrow, where he's like, I still want to be his friend. You know, I love. So that. for me, it was uh, the Fox and the Hound, the Disney film, that made me uh, think of Cassius and Darrow. So it was always the Fox and the Hound relationship for me, which is based off the Prince and the Pauper. Um, and so that was always the, um, the what I had in mind when I was creating their friendship and their animosity. Okay. Because there's that feeling when the when the fox is hiding and the hound is part of the group chasing him, uh, he's like one of the hounds. That's what I wanted, like Golden Sun, to feel like, you know, of uh, Cassius when he's on the opposing side, and Cassius when he finds Darrow in the table in Book Three and puts the cloak over him. You know, yeah, he's running with the hounds, but there's still that. You see that by Cassius putting the cape over him. You see, there's still that pull on his heart too. Hey, is Lauren a little bit of a space racist? If he found out that Darrow was a red, would he have just knifed him? Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, so. that's the most tragic thing about it. He would have knifed him, you know, and I'm not sure Daryl could have stopped him. On a different timeline, could Tactus have had the hero's journey? Yeah, if yeah. he'd survived Lauren, yeah, 100%. Think he I think he would light. Yeah, yeah, I think he would have, uh, living in the shadows of his brother, I think that he would have found strength in living as a repudiation of his brothers. Uh, and with Daryl backing him and really trusting him and forgiving him for that one time, I really believe that Cassius, i sorry, that Tactus would have become the best version of himself, you know? Are you a Stephen King fan? Some, you know, it's never really just, it's just never really hit with me. Mm. Um, I've read some of the gunslinger. Uh, I really love the tone. Uh, I, I mean, I've read a bunch of his books, um, but I don't know. It's just never really gotten me like some other authors have. Um, I, but I, I read the gunslinger and I love the tone, but it, it just, I don't know why it never grabbed me. And that it honestly for many years has made me feel quite dumb. Um, you know, like, I'm like, I just have never, like, I should dedicate more time to getting into it. And I sometimes feel like nah, I'm not a real reader because I don't read Stephen King. I'm a little bit ashamed of it, to be honest. Uh, let's see, put a name in the hat. I mean, he's put lots of names. Lots the of hat. names. Tung hat. Tungless was in the hat, right? Oh yeah. Tungless. Well, Tungless, was Tungless, Tungless was a whole story arc that I was going to go down. He was like a, a, a Lord of the syndicate. Um, no one of the lords of the lords of the syndicate they got deposed by you know a certain bone rider and uh yeah, then like that you have this idea mapped out mm -hmm. and then you're like but you stick to it you stick to your conviction you say okay i drew his name he's gone that's that's awesome he had to go yeah tongueless got pulled and but also it actually worked out because uh we were having trouble fitting in tongueless in sections in the later part of the book and so um you know just it got really dense and how do you explore you know the 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 uh, the intricacies of the uh, tongueless is passed in the syndicate. And I was like, you know what? It's better to just kill him because <laughs> he's a guy. Cause it also represents that, that character like, Oh, this guy's, this guy's gotta be important. He's gotta be, have this great story. And he does, he did, but he died. So we didn't get to see it. And I well, feel like that's no, I would have liked compelling to, seen, to me. I'd like to see more of Romulus. Uh, I mean, the, mm. the dragon, the, the, the dragon mm. tomb stuff was just like a dagger, man. I love it. I, lo I love oh, the moonies. I think the moonies I love are awesome. I love Romulus. He's he's probably my favorite underexplored character. Yeah. He's so goddamn fun. Um, I would have loved to have seen him in Atlas as brothers when they were young, you know? I always imagine characters from other series crossing over, especially for beating characters that are utterly despicable. Which three characters do you like to bring over? Mine is Optimus Prime creator. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what's, uh, what's Lelouch? I thought maybe you knew. I thought that would be a Roman thing, maybe. <laughs> Maybe, maybe I'm showing uh, the shallowness of my uh, intellect. I don't know Lelouch. I mean, but Kratos, I guess. Kratos would Kratos fit, would fit right in. Yeah. Kratos, yeah, Kratos. And I mean, him and Ragnar would have been buddies, I think. Yeah, yeah. man, they'd kick ass together. Well, Actually, just uh, Topicles POV. <laughs> jelly beans, jelly beans, jelly beans. <laughs> yeah, it'd have to be like, yeah, that'd be, that'd be pretty funny. I'm yeah. sorry, did you, have, did you have three characters that you would like to see crossover? Me? Yeah. Oh, uh, I didn't really think that way. No. Yeah. That's a tough question. That's a tough one. I'd have to really think about it. But not really. It's I, I, I never thought about that. 
anime character. Everybody's oh, saying. duh, 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 duh. Okay, that makes sense. I've, I've the only the only anime I've watched is oh. uh, is is Vinland Saga. I have one care. Oh, really? You need to watch the Berserk ones. They're really good. I would have guts from Berserk come over. Oh yeah, sure. I would have guts come because I want to see guts just like wreck shop, just kill the shit out of everyone. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, Darrow and Guts actually have a lot in common. I actually didn't find Berserk until I was like already halfway done with the series. I found oh, I found Berserk during Dark Age, which probably also helps um, explain some of the tone. Was Sophocles inspired by Cylon region? No, no, I don't really. Is that from the t- the original TV series? Man, I was too young to even remember that. Yeah, no, uh, I guess I did. I, I didn't. I, was that in the original one? I didn't see I that. Think, I know they had a dog on there. I remember my parents watching. Oh. Like, this isn't Star Wars. I'm out of here. <laughs> no, I, I I honestly think Sophocles was just well, obviously Sophocles, the playwright for Antigone, but then uh, the Fox. I just thought it. I thought uh, what's really cool about Cavax is, you know, he plays dumb, but it's really fucking bright. And then there's that line that uh, Lauren says, I think, if your hair played the fox, if you're the fox, play the hair. And so, like, the fox is the only peacock in Cavax does to tell actually how smart he is. That was kind of like my little thing. I love Cavax. You know, I, know I was wrong about Doxo. I had this theory about Doxo for so long. Yeah. Because there's this scene in Morningstar where the, the sovereign's like, kill everybody except Doxo. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah. She had yeah. a link of hoots. And then I got the Dark Age. I was like, well, guess not. <laughs> <laughs> no, she she wanted she wanted to keep uh, the gen the gen in line. She didn't want to destroy the television. Oh, no more gens. families, no more. Yeah, and she felt like they, if, if like if they got like Daxo is the one person who'd probably work with him even if they killed his family. Like oh. he's still he's just very very practical man, um, and he would see the benefit in that. Spencer says, I "Want to say thank you so much for these books." Mike got me the series, fell in love with them, teared up multiple times throughout them. Thanks for reading, brother. Uh, I got some more tears for you in Lightbringer. Not all sad tears. There's happy tears too. Have you ever read any Brandon Sanderson? I've seen that question a lot. I read the first one. Yeah. Um, didn't uh, end up reading the second, but I hear that I should. Yeah. Words of Radius is really, really good. Yeah. Might be a little too lighthearted for you though. <laughs> I don't know, guys. He was just saying was Inspirations was a Disney movie. He's not, he's not, he doesn't have a cold. Uh, I'm not totally cold hearted, hearted. but th- that's, you know, a bit of the thing. I prefer. Um, I prefer kind of Joe Abercrombie's world, um, and, uh, you know, the, the Malazans and, uh, uh, you know, George R. R. Martin, um, naturally, I mean, I might dive into it, but, you know, I think that there's, um, yeah, I haven't fallen in love with the Stormlight Archives, but I might, you know, and that's so funny. Cause I mean, I had, uh, I had Name of the Wind on my shelf when I was writing Red Rising. I had it five years before I dove into it and I just fall started it twice. And uh, didn't like it that first, the first two times, and then finally just read it in like two days, and was like, "Holy crap!" So it's funny how books are like that, you know. You'll resist, and then you'll be like, "Why didn't I see this magic before?" Have you ever put Darrow's name in the hat? It's funny because me and my friend Armin were like, "I would be, I would be shocked if Darrow dies in Dark Age." <laughs> yeah, that was the only name I didn't put in the hat. That would be, that would be, that would be a shit way to start the book. Like, I feel like I'd lose half the readers, you know. And I'm not sure it'd be worth it just to get that narrative twist in. How much Norse mythology goes into the obsidians? A bit, you know, not uh, hopefully not enough to weigh down the uh, series. Mostly what goes in are esoteric rites and things like that. Like uh, Seppi, uh, the quiet and her Jarls um, cutting apart the ox beforehand, uh, before battle, divining organs, things like that. There's also elements, you know, when coming up with names for the Norse, um, and sometimes they're not so much their language, but more so their names and some of their kind of like warrior myth. But more so, it's kind of the anthropological, the anthropology I dive into more so is their uh, way of dealing and interpreting life, you know, and their way of interpreting death. So because I feel like that affects the characters the most. So it's less about world building so much for me in terms of the myth, the, the Norse myth and stuff, and more so about diving into, you know, how do they perceive the world. Hey, I was watching Vikings when I when I read this. So I was like, "Hey, Ragnar, oh, yeah. great, great." Yeah, yeah. Well, the funny thing is, uh, it was based <laughs> off of Ragnar Lothbrok, but I'm not sure. Vi- I'm not sure Vikings was out yet. Uh, it might have been, but I was like a big fan of the 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 Lothbrok brothers, like all the the kids of uh, Ragnar, like Ivar the Boneless and uh, Bjorn, like Bjorn going down yeah. into the Mediterranean. I always thought it was so cool when I found that in history because I couldn't imagine Vikings in the Mediterranean. 
Dennis, I don't think I would fit in one of his books, but I'd be honored if he killed me off. I think he killed Peter V. Brett off in one of his books. I, I did. I killed I Peter off. <laughs> <laughs> so I would definitely, I would love to be killed off in a book. It'd be great. You know, I, I might find a place for you, Mike. All right. All right. What color do you think you'd be? Gray, probably. I think probably you think gray. you'd be a gray? Oh, then you're definitely dying. <laughs> you know my grays don't last long. That's the great. Do you have a writing playlist? I do, but I find I write best in silence. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'll be releasing a playlist that I developed for Lightbringer, but I find I write best in silence without even um, – because I, otherwise I feel like I'm trying to match the music and capture the tone of the music, which is uh, very difficult to do. And so I'll find that I start a book often listening to music and then write 90% of it in silence. Which one of your covers is your favorite? Mine's Dark Age. Mm. Dark Age is hard to beat. Oh, yeah, I think uh, Golden Sun. Uh, especially the the subterranean press edition with Darrow standing there like with oh, yeah, being well, all gold. That's like, a little out of my a lot of out of my price bracket. <laughs> but, but I did those, it. I love those, the art. The, those things those things are pricey. Yeah, they do such a limited limited amount too. I'd love to do more special editions. And what color would you be? Mm, I probably identify most with reds. You know, my uh, whole family like family's been in America for quite a long time, but they've always been the. Uh, you know, the bootleggers, the bushwhackers, and the farmers. And I guess uh, we should end it with, is there going to be a sub press of Lightbringer? <laughs> yes, there will be, I imagine. I, uh, imagine I saw the so. day Broken Binding was saying, you know, we only do fantasy, but we're getting a lot of requests for Red Rising. Should we break our own rule for that? And I was like, look. It's fantasy. I, if, I was like, if people consider Dune sci fantasy, I, say, I, I guess you could consider this the same thing. But I was like, but you yeah. know, you're talking about new, pretty editions of these books. Yeah, sure, go ahead. I'll, I think I'll... it's, I think it's science fantasy. I mean, that's honestly how I, how I think of it as. Uh, it's always made sense in my mind. You know, because I feel like the most, I would say, like the the greatest spiritual uh, ancestor that my book has is Dune. You know. And that's why, and that's why guys, like I saw someone say, oh, this, this interview is making me just like, it's endearing me to this author more. And I know how I felt when I was like, yeah, I really liked your books. And they said, well, Dune's my favorite book of all time. I said, I love this author. I love this author. He's oh yeah. And then they're, like, they're trying to move the line along and we're just chatting Dune the whole damn time. Yeah. yeah. Good. Good. Well, I could talk all day about Dune. Yeah. It's, you know, and Shadow and Claw has that same sort of, um, uh, it captured the world captured me in the same way, perhaps not the world, but the tone captured me in the same way Dune did. You excited and that, that other author, uh, the guy who wrote Sun Eater, what's his name again? Chris Ferracchio. Yeah, I think you Chris Ferracchio. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure did. you two were separated at birth because you both talk about like Cicero and shit. Yeah. Was... Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> People say I like him. Uh, I'll probably stave off reading um, sci-fi until I finish the series. But he maybe said he's going to finish writing his before he writes yours because he said so many people got got your series confused. They asked us, so what does the AU mean? <laughs> Uh, like, yeah. About, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. Uh, since you say now that you say that, I will definitely wait. Like I looked at some of his naming conventions because I just looked at the um, the description um, on Amazon or something, and I was like, yeah, yeah, we're drawn from the same well here. Yeah, I no, mean, I, you guys I would bet click there's for sure. I bet there. I bet our reading list is very comparable. Absolutely. If he's dropping Cicero and Plutarch, then yeah, he's my boy. Yeah, yeah, you guys would get along great. So. Uh, guys, he was writing before he did this interview, and I feel like I stopped him. So yeah, Biden what the hell, Mike? Why are you everything? delaying the next book? Why are you Why are you doing this? Yes, it's my fault, guys. It's my fault. Yeah, remember the thing is, I did I did a Why You Should Read video about Red Rising like three years mm -hmm. ago, and in that video, I watched it again recently because someone said you said that this that you wouldn't imagine that the next book would be out by this time next year. <laughs> so I feel like I've gotten blamed for that a lot now. So uh, it just uh, yeah. You can blame me. It's all your fault, brother. It's all your fault. So. This is why you have to die in the new book. I, I'm there for it. So thank you so much for finally doing this. I appreciate it so much. Uh, again, I hope I didn't hound you too. No, very much not at all, man. Guess, I, talking about talking about this kind of stuff, I get a general kick and time seems to fly fast. Can't believe it's already been an hour and 20. When you're done writing, if you want to just come on and talk about Doom, man, we can do that. We can do I'd that. love to. I'd Please love to, man. Please have me back. Please pester me again. I will definitely. Pay. You're back on Twitter now, right? Right. Yeah, and uh, since Matthew did contribute, I will say no new POVs in Lightbringer. We're going oh, deeper into the ones we already have. Several POV is lost forever, you guys. Several POV. Well, you know, maybe it'll make a debut in some alternative universe. You gotta you be awesome. talking about bragging about not taking a shower for five days. I would love it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. That's, yeah, that's a Tuesday for Severo, right? Showering. Only when, only when Victor's around, you know?
mm, how he landed Victor. That's a, and the world will never know. The world will never know. You know, I was you one know? of those who said Darrow and Victor should have got together and conquered the galaxy. And people said, nah, it's just too OP. <laughs> it, it is a little too OP. It is a little too OP. But I think Victor likes Severo because he's the only one that doesn't give a fuck about her being beautiful, about her being wealthy, about her doing anything except not telling lies, you know? Like the I, thing she values most about herself, he values most about her. So he had her at I'm gold, bitch, right? Yeah. And she's just like, okay, <laughs> who are you? Well, I yeah. seriously appreciate it, man. This has been a blast for me. And uh, hey, I can't so wait fun, to read the new book. Can't wait. Can't wait. Can't well, I'm wait. excited, man. Besides Wind of Winter, it's my most anticipated new book, but I really believe that this one's actually going to be in my hands. So yeah. That's fair, man. You got about a seniority. That's fair. All right. Well, thanks for watching, guys. What's that? Is it coming? Is Winds of Winter coming out? Did, did, did was there news on that? Oh, okay. All right. And I thought you knew is, something I didn't know. And this is what I said with Dancing Dragons. It's like when it's right here, I'll believe it. I mean, I, I'm I'm at his publisher. I'm friends with his editor, and I ask questions. And she just does, and I'm just like, I put three, four, four drinks into her, and she still won't tell me. I'm like this woman. Of course. Well, you think we'll, see, we'll she, see that. We'll see that or Doors of Stone first. Which one do you think? We'll I, I heard whispers about Doors of Stone. Really? Wow. Is that wrong? I thought uh, maybe. You seem maybe. like you're more plugged in than me on these things. So. Yeah. Uh, unless I'm wrong, but I thought I heard some. Uh, yeah, I heard, thought I heard some stuff. So maybe I think Doors of Stone might be first. Hmm. From right. my from my understanding of things. That said, you know, I haven't seen. The only time I see you know really he's doing right no, now, guys, he's getting your hopes up so he can crush you because he loves your tears. He needs his. He's, I he's would never do that. Right? No, no, no. I only do that in my world. I've never do that in other people's worlds. Uh, the, the, the problem is, you know, you never like once COVID happened, I kind of got plugged out of everything because usually I, I get this information from the like the authors uh, gossiping like, you know, over drinks or something. And, um, you know, it really kind of sandbagged the whole Comic Con thing. Um, but hopefully Comic Cons are starting back up again. You know, we had last year, and I'm going to Phoenix Comic Con this year, so maybe I'll have some. Dirt are you going to Howler Con? I think I'll I think I'll make an appearance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm debating going to Dragon Con this year. I've never done it, but you know. Yeah. Are you going to go to Howler Con? Uh, I've talked to uh, Ben and Aaron on Howler Pod. They keep doing these spoiler talks of each book with these movies, and they're they're trying to convince me since it's, it's just Oklahoma. You know, it's just it's one. It's just day. up there, brother. Yeah, just up there. Day. Come play. It'll I be might. fun. I might. I might. All so. right. If you do, we'll talk to you. All right, man. Guys, take care, and thanks for watching. And Pierce, you rock. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me, man. See you. Thanks, guys, for watching.